You don't have to stand up, but I would like you to bow your heads with me, raise your hands one more time. We're going to pray before we go to the word with our hands lifted high to heaven. Heavenly Father, God, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory as we open your word to hear it preached. I thank you, Lord, that my words are not mine alone, but that your spirit speaks through me. That you, as we've already asked, that you speak to each and every person in this room. And that, Lord, I'm grateful your word is, it always returns with results. It never returns void. So we thank you, Lord, for a profitable time in your word today. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. I want you to turn to James chapter 5, verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16. If you include Agreement Sunday, this is part four, or if you just want to count after that, this is part three of Praying with Power. We've also done uh, services on Wednesday, and I've done a couple things where I've been posting on YouTube uh, throughout the week. Just I, I know I've got so much in me on prayer that I'm not going to have enough to get it out before we get into Soulmate Sunday and transition after that. So I wanted to uh, uh, try to do some extra stuff, so Make sure that you follow us on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube so you don't miss those things. But in James 5, 16, we get some instruction on the power of prayer. Everybody say praying with power. What does it mean to pray with power? What kind of power are we talking about? What does, what does that look like? In the uh, New King James Version, it says, confess your trespasses to one another. And the Amplified lets us know that's your faults, your slip ups and things like that. It says that pray for one another that you may be healed. On Wednesday night, we took a moment, and we circled up, and we prayed for one another. We have a service every Wednesday night. Tuesday is our youth night, but Wednesday night, we have a service for the adults right here in this room. We worship for about 15 minutes or so, teach for a little bit, and then we'll do corporate prayer. We'll all pray together. It's a great service, especially during this season where we're talking about prayer because you get to put it in action in a corporate prayer set setting. What, what that means is that we corporately pray together. It doesn't mean like a business meeting. Not like corporation, but corporate prayer, united prayer. Amen? We did that on Wednesday. We circled up and had everybody pray for one another. Take prayer requests to pray for one another. You should be praying for your family. You should be praying for your brothers and sisters uh, and your brothers and sisters in Christ. You should be praying. Um, in the New Testament, Paul also wrote, hey, you should be praying for those who are in, in authority above you. You should be praying for kings. You should be praying for people. Then he says this. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now that might be a term, avails much. What does that mean? The Amplified says it this way. It makes much power available that's dynamic in its working. Fervent, effective prayer makes power available. You know, I've come to learn something about God that I think will really apply to us today. God is very future focused. If you read through, I'm reading through Genesis right now, with my daughter Kaylee, she's seven, and we're kind of reading through it, and, 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 and uh, it's been interesting for her because she's, I mean, just learned to read in the last year or so, a uh, year and a half maybe, and she's a good reader, but obviously there's some heavy stuff in Genesis, and some big names, and you know, so she's, she's, uh, <laughs> she's having some fun with it, amen. But uh, as I read through it, I'm reminded that every time God made a covenant with, covenant with somebody, it was future. It was future focused. I mean, when he took Abraham, he didn't just tell Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. He changed his name. You're, you're going to be the father of many nations. And then he had to keep reminding him, Abraham, look at the sand. Look at the stars in the sky. He, began, he had to keep giving him a vision of where you're going, what you're going to do. Joseph, man, talk about Joseph. I mean, that guy, if you've ever been knocked down before, just read the story of Joseph. You ever felt like you've been set back? Read the story of Joseph. If you don't get anything out of it, open your receptor and read it again. Because dude could not fail. Could not fail. No matter what came against him, no matter what, I mean, his brothers sold him into slavery, God brought him out of that. The uh, Potiphar's wife lied on him, God brought him out of that. In jail, God brought him out of that. God brought him, why? Because at the beginning of his life, he got a vision. He, got a, he had a dream. What was the dream for? Was it for the next week? Was it for the next month? Was it for that year? It was a future dream. It was a future vision. It was a future goal of this is where I'm taking you. One day, your brothers are going to bow down to you. He told them. They laughed at him. Then he showed them another dream. 
One day your whole family, including your mother and father, they're going to bow down to you. And his dad kind of mocked him. What, what do you, what do you, what? You think I'm going to bow down to you? He obviously never forgot that dream because no matter what happened to him, I mean, left in a pit, sold into slavery, lied on, cheated on, knocked down, God continuously, continuously brought him out. I mean, how do you go from being in a jail? Be, I mean, being in a jail, the, like right after he gets put in the jail, he's in charge of the jail. Read it. I mean, he gets put in jail, and he was so well-received, so much favor on him in jail. He gets lied on. They, they, they think he's an adulterer. He gets put in jail, and then the next day, he's in charge of it, running it. And then he so, does so well there, when the guests get put in, into the jail, he's in charge of them. So then guys from uh, Pharaoh's uh, 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 um, clan come in, the uh, cupbearer and all come in, the baker comes in, and he interprets their dream. Now they... One, get, one gets killed, then the other one forgets the dream, for, I mean, forgets the interpreter, forgets what Joseph did, and God still, years later, brings him out. And in one day, he goes from running a jail to running the kingdom. God will not let you fail if you trust in him. God will not allow you to fail if you trust him. The Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God shall deliver them from, the, from them all. Everybody just begin to build your faith this morning and say, God's going to deliver me. No matter what comes against me, God is a deliverer and he'll deliver me. God doesn't want to see you stay in a, in a, a, a lackluster, mediocre situation. God doesn't want to, I mean, hey, at least if I'm going to be in jail, I'm in charge of it, but that wasn't good enough. No, God said, I told you you're going to have your family bow down to you. Well, in order for your family to bow down to you, the entire kingdom and surrounding kingdoms had to be submitted in authority to Pharaoh and thereby Joseph, who he put in charge. God will take you from the bottom to the top. God will take you from zero to hero. How do you do that, though? I mean, let's be real. If we're future focused, what are most of our prayers related to? I mean, most of our prayers are related to a problem we're facing right now. Most of our prayers are focused on a problem we're dealing with right now. I mean, I hope that, and one of the things we've tried to cover over this season is that prayer goes beyond just asking God for things. Prayer also includes fellowshipping with God, worshiping and praising God. That's part of your prayer life. If, you, if, you had a, if you're married, we're going to be talking about marriage in a couple weeks, so I've been brushing up, I've been reading, I've been studying, amen, trying to get ready. Listen, if you have a marriage and all you do is, uh, one only talks, the husband, we know this won't be true because husbands have a very limited word count. Us men, we only talk so many words a day, and if you have a job where you talk a lot, you're a salesman or whatever, you get home and your wife's just... And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm done talking. I talked all I can talk today. I can't talk anymore. <laughs> well, you can imagine if, I'm going to just stop right there. I'll deal with that on, on, on February 11th. <laughs> you can imagine, though, if one person continuously, they were the only one that talked and the other one never talked back, what kind of relationship would that be? We can't do that with God without prayer. It can't just be a one-sided. It needs to be a two-way conversation. You need to give time for God to speak back. Amen. We're in Ephesians 5.1, we're told to be imitators of God. Imitators of God, to imitate God. If God is future-minded, so should we be. God doesn't live from day to day. He invests for the future. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, he put in motion, Jesus is going to come and fix this whole situation. So I can be back in communion with my, fam my, my, my people, the, my, who I created. That day. Took thousands of years, but that day he put it in motion. God is future-minded. We cannot live in the past, and we cannot worry about tomorrow. What does Matthew 6 say? Don't worry about tomorrow, because it worries about itself. So we'll knock today out of the park if we've processed our future through prayer. Does that make sense? I, I can't live in the past. I can't, we as Christians, you cannot live in the past. You cannot change yesterday. You cannot change what they did to you. You cannot change what they said to you. You cannot change. Now, what, what can we do, though? We can process through prayer the plan of God to rectify the situation and take care of tomorrow. But at the same time, I can't worry about tomorrow. 
Many of us, unfortunately, live in situations where you're worried about the 30th of the month because the bills are due. You're worried about tomorrow. You're unsure. There's an unsurety. There's an there's a, a unstableness. We talked about the stableness of God already, and, and you're living in an unstable situation. And when you live in a situation like that, the Bible instructs us, don't worry about tomorrow. So then how can I, through prayer, be confident? In, be, because if I know God's word, he says that he'll take care of tomorrow. But yet we worry about it. We worry about the test we've got on Friday. And the evaluation we've got next week. And we worry about those things. There's a confidence, and I'm going back to James 5, 16. Everybody say power. And a power that comes through prayer that will help you live today and not today out of the park because you're confident about tomorrow. If you're not confident about tomorrow, you're not going to be confident about today. If you're not, if you're not sure that God's going to take care of my evaluation in two weeks or God's going to take care of that bill that's coming due or God's going to help me and lead me and guide me, then, what, then, then the dealing with today becomes very difficult. Agree or disagree? It becomes very difficult. It's hard to be a good spouse because they're talking to you and you're just thinking about that thing. It's hard to be a good friend because the boss is going to pull you into his office in an hour and you're trying to help the coworker that says, hey, will you pray for me? And you're not really listening because you're thinking about, because you're unsure. And the truth is, you don't really trust that God's going to take care of it. Either A, you don't know his word, or B, you haven't processed the plan and gotten instructions from God through prayer, and so you don't know how he's going to bring you through. See, you can have a confidence in the word and still not know how it's going to happen. Right? You can have a confidence in the word and know, okay, I don't know how, I, okay, I believe God's word, but how am I going to actually get there? How am I going to actually get from here to the fruition of God, his promise coming to pass in my life? Everybody say, God's promises are yes and amen. If they are, then how do I get to the yes and amen? You can't live in yesterday. You can't live in yesterday. You know Colonel Sanders? Y'all know who Colonel Sanders is? And y'all are real emphatic about that one, man. That was like the most emphatic response. Look, KFC's going to be flooded after church. What happened? Pastor preached about KFC. He had Colonel Sanders in there. It was, mm, I need some fried chicken today. <laughs> Colonel Sanders, listen to this, was, he was 62 years old with $105 in the bank and tried to start a fried chicken franchise with his recipe after 1,009 rejections. You know, I actually heard a story about how he got saved. And I don't know the pastor personally, but the, 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 the pastor, he's, his, uh, he, he was the son, it was his dad, that... Colonel Sanders came in, sat on the front row, and got saved. This was before he got saved. This was, I mean, an, an unsaved person with the persistence. I'll be honest. How many, don't raise your hand, but how many of you would have quit after 10, 100? I mean, 500 rejections. 1,000 and not. Who keeps track of that? I mean, for real, who keeps track of that? Like, he must have known, I'm going to be famous one day, and now this thing's going to go everywhere. I'm going to keep track of all these people that rejected me. 1,009. The rest is history. He gets the deal, franchise all over America and now the world. How about Thomas Edison? He invented the light bulb, right? You know, his quote, his pretty famous quote, you might have heard it. I haven't failed yet. I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. When you pray, when you really pray, the way I'm going to teach you to pray today, I'm going to give you eight points that will help you with prayer. Eight things we have to do in prayer. When you do these and put these practically in your life every day, every day, when you walk these out every day, when you make your, your, your prayer life look like this every day, you'll actually process the plan of God and you'll be better off than Thomas Edison and Colonel Sanders. Because God has a system to not only Make his word come true, but you'll process the plan. Amen. So before I get into this, everybody say that. Say prayer, prayer. Processes, processes the plans of God. I know I've had you repeat a lot of stuff, and you're like, how much longer is he going to do that? Probably until 12 o'clock. 
So just, you know, get ready. I like to repeat. I like you to build your faith. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts I have, or that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Everybody say future. future. See, I told you I'd keep doing it. Future. You have a God who loves you dearly and who's concerned. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every care that's inside of your soul. He knows everything you're going through and how you feel about it. And he says, and he told Jeremiah, I know what I'm thinking about you. You need to start thinking like I think about you. You need to start thinking like I think about you because I've got plans for you. I feel like if he had written it today, it would have been like, bruh, bruh, I got plans for you. You need to think what I'm thinking towards you. Thoughts to give you a future and a hope. God's got a future for you. God, and your future is not some mamby-pamby, lackluster, mediocre future. God actually has a bright future for you. He has a plan for you. He has a hope for you. He wants you to do great things. He wants you to do amazing things. He wants you to make an impact in your job. He wants you to lead your household with, with I mean, listen, if you're a man, he wants you to lead your household like nobody else leads their household. He wants you to be, I mean, be a God-fearing, I mean, your household does well. Everybody comes to you for advice. Everybody comes to you for how do you do it? How do you make it? You know why God wants that? Because if you do it right, then you can say, Amen. God help me. Man, how did you get out of that financial crisis? I remember you, you went bankrupt and you went, God help me. God help me. God, God help me. God connected me to a church that properly taught the word and put faith in me and put me on the right path. And then I began to put it into work and put it into practice and take God's word and apply it to my life. And as I follow God's word, this book that we have is not just a book. It is an instruction manual for a successful life. And when you follow the instructions, your life will become successful. God guarantees it. So one of those instructions is to pray. How do you get a future and a hope? How do you step into that? How do you walk into that? Prayer processes the plans of God. Look at this uh, other scripture, Jeremiah 33, a couple chapters later. 33, 3, we're going to look at it in a couple of translations. What does it say in the New King James? Call to me, notice this, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. He's telling Jeremiah, listen, this is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. I'm, I have things you don't know. The Bible describes God as all-knowing. He's he's, we are limited in our capacity, but God knows. God can see around the curve. God, God can see when the, you, it looks like your business is doing well, and God can see, no, COVID's about to hit, and you need to do X, Y, and Z. You don't know why you feel to do it, but you do it, and then all of a sudden when COVID hits, you go, okay. Obviously, I'm, I'm in the past, but I'm just using this as an example. Think, like, God knows things. He knows things you and I don't know. And he's telling Jeremiah, listen, I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Look at this in the NET. You can look at it several translations. They're all great. Call on me in prayer. Look at that, in prayer. Call on me when? In prayer. Call on me, and I may answer you. I'll th I'll th listen, if I'm not busy with all the stuff I got going up in heaven, I'll answer you. If you get a busy line, just wait patiently. Sometimes Mondays are really busy. I will answer you. You have to have a confidence that if I'm praying, as long, the only thing the Bible instructs is make sure you've forgiven other people and there's no sin in between. You ask God to forgive you, you're forgiven, pray. Call on him and he'll answer. Call on him and he'll answer you. Call on him and he'll answer you. And what? I will show you great, now here he says, mysterious things, which you still do not know about. That word, mysterious, also is rendered hidden in a few other translations. Hidden, mysterious things, things you don't know about. Things that are in God's bank vault and God's box where, that you need the key to and the key you get through prayer. He says, call on me and I'll show you these things. You know, right after this, if you read the whole chapter, the uh, uh, Babylonian people were about to destroy Jerusalem. God's people had, 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 
had become full of sin. God was not happy with it. He said, I'm going to turn my back on them. The, their cities are going to fall. Your city's going to fall. But don't worry. After that, I'm going to forgive their sins. See, he gives them a future. I'm going to forgive their sins. I'm going to clean up the city. I'm going to bring it back. The city, he, he gives them great detail. Listen, the city's going to be empty. The streets are going to be empty. The, read it. And he says, ah, don't worry. I'm going to bring it all back. I'm going to fix it all. We're going to bring it back, and that city will be something special. But back in verse 3, that ain't it. He's saying, call on me, and I'll show you hidden things. That word hidden, this is so cool. Listen, that word mysterious, hidden, it's an adjective that's normally used to describe cities or walls as fortified or inaccessible. So right before he tells them about how, this is so good. God is so good. Right before he tells them how Babylonian, the Babylonian Empire is going to come in and knock down the walls of Jerusalem and then have full access to Jerusalem. How the Babylonians are going to, walls you can't get through right now, but they're going to get through them. That same way, that same word he would use to describe that, he's, he's literally telling Jeremiah, when you call on me, I'll let you in the walls you can't get into right now. I'll give you access to what you can otherwise never get access to. I'll give you solutions that you can't otherwise get access to, that you don't know about, that you wouldn't know. I'm just curious, I actually am going to have you show your hands. Who in here has been praying and seeking the Lord about something, and all of a sudden you got an idea, you know it wasn't you because you didn't think of it, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, that'll work. Hey, that'll work. You know, maybe I should try that. And then you try it, and you're like, huh, awesome. God has secret things. God is a solution being, solution entity. He, like, he's not up in heaven. Listen, you've got to wrap your head around this before you pray. God's not up in heaven trying to figure it out with you. Hey, uh, thank you for bringing that information to me. I'm going to have to get back with you on this one, bro. I'm a little perplexed on this one, too. Let me, let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. Brother Darrell is in uh, call support, right? And you imagine if you called him, when you call him, he's supposed to know what to do. Right? You ever have those people, this is, I'm sure it's not Brother Durrell because he's like super knowledgeable. But you ever have those people, you call them, and you can tell they're just reading the screen? Bro, I already Googled it and read what you read. I don't need you to read off the same thing. I need an expert on this brother printer right now. The printer's not working. I need it to print. But I'm trying to be saved right now and be all holy and be all nice to you. But I don't want to be nice right now because you're doing this. I already, yes, sir, I already did that. And you're not doing anything. Yes, sir, I already restarted it. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, uh -huh, I did that. Yes, I pressed the blue button. I, yes, sir, I did that. Can I please get to something that I don't know? Can I please get to something? I'm trying to fix my printer. Can you please give me the information? I already did everything you're reading. And all of a sudden they say, hold on one second. And that annoying music. Why can't they pick better music? <laughs> Come on. Do you have any control over the music, man? You got to pick better, be better music. I'm like, man, what, what? Finally, a different girl comes on. Hi, sir. How are you today? Great. Real, I'll be doing a lot better when my printer works. I usually don't say that, but that's what's in my head. Anybody else? Right? And then all of a sudden, homegirl or homegirl, the, the, the expert gets on, and what do they say? Did you try such and such and such and such? Did you try disconnecting the blah, 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 and the blue? Did you try? And I'm like, no, I didn't. I, I didn't think of that. And that wasn't on Google. And then you try it, and guess what? It works. Because you get the expert who has the information you wouldn't otherwise know. When you spend time properly in prayer, and spend time every day in prayer, spend time processing the plan of God through prayer, you'll get the answers you wouldn't otherwise know. You'll get direction you wouldn't otherwise know. Call on me, and I'll answer you. I'll let you in to the fortified city of information that I have and give you the secret things. Give you the secret things. God's not up in heaven figuring it out. He's got the knowledge. He's got the information. He's got it. And he just, you, just need to, you just need to get it. You just need to get it. He'll help you get through your financial crisis. He'll help you get through your marriage that's failing. He'll help you get through your problem kid. You know, it's so frustrating. 
When you try to ask for help, it's, oh, um, and you can tell, why did I even ask this person? They don't know. I'm not telling you to not seek wise counsel. The Bible instructs us to do that. Because sometimes as you seek wise counsel, God will speak through them. There's been times where I've sat across from Pastor Steve's desk, and as he's talking through something, and because he's got a lot of wisdom and knowledge, they came by yesterday. Pastor Steve and Amy came by to see um, our new building, and we're walking through, this with, through there with us. And it's amazing, somebody who's built several churches and built several buildings, how they walk through and they see things differently. They walk through and they see it. Well, you should do this. You know, you might should consider putting that over there. Yeah, you know, you, have you ever thought about you might need? They see stuff differently, right? There's been times where I've sat across from his desk asking him for something, and while he's talking about whatever, right, the Lord will speak to me. Like, he'll say one key word, and I'm like, okay, that's it. It's not exactly what he's talking about, but he points me in the right direction, and the Holy Spirit takes it from there. So there's nothing wrong with wise counsel, but it's that have you processed the plan through God? The other thing that happens sometimes is you'll get a, a, a direction, but then you don't know how to get there. Like, how, like, I, I want to go to school. I want to learn a new skill. And you ask the Lord for it. And he says, yeah, okay, so go to this school. But then you can't get in. And you can't get through the admissions process. Or you don't have the money. And so you might get that future, but then how do you process the plan? Number one, we must pray from the heart. God needs to know your heart. He needs to know from your heart where you're at. Now, what this is, is a twofold meeting. Number one, you do need to pour your heart out to him, but you also, our spirit is the inside of us. So I'm not talking about your boom, boom, boom heart. I'm talking about your innermost being, your spirit, your heart. Your, that's where you must be full of the word, which is the second point, but I want you to catch my thoughts on this. When I pray, I'm coming from a, a heart perspective of God has the solution. That's why I spent so much time setting this up with, if you don't realize God's not up in heaven trying to figure this out with you, God has the answers. God's, God wants you to trust him and walk through this with him, walk it out. He's going to lead you, but it might be a step-by-step -step process. Again, he might tell you, yes, you need to go to such and such school, but then by faith, how, where's the money? Don't get frustrated in the in-between. That Joseph dream you have in your heart. One day, I'm going to stand up at the top, and they're going to bow down to me. What if he got frustrated in the pit? What if he got frustrated on the ox cart on the way over to Egypt? What a bunch of bull hockey. God gave me these dreams. My father gave me a coat of many colors, and now it's gone. They ripped it up, took it. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a slave. What, what, good, what, good was, what good was that dream, God? What good was that? See, if you're praying from the heart, you won't pray like that. If you're praying from the heart, it'll be, Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't know how I ended up in this ox cart, but I know it wasn't you. I don't know how I ended up a slave, but I know it wasn't you. You put a dream in my heart that one day people are going to bow down to me. That one day I'll be in charge. That one day I'll be successful. And I know I don't, at least I don't see how I do that as a slave. So Heavenly Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for taking me out of this ox cart as soon as possible. He could have been sold anywhere in Egypt, but he ends up in Potiphar's house. And he's so successful, so favorable as an outsider, as a Hebrew slave, Within a short period of time, he's running Potiphar's house. I mean, so much so that Potiphar said, I don't want to do anything. I want you to do all of it. Because he didn't complain. He wasn't negative. He was, I have from my heart an expectation God is going to make that dream come to pass. Whatever dream you have, don't lose it. Write that down. Don't lose, don't lose your dream. Don't lose your dream. Don't lose the vision. Habakkuk says, write the vision down and make it plain. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. I'm telling you this morning, by the Holy Spirit, don't lose it. Don't lose your dream. Don't lose it. Don't let anybody take it from you. Don't let anybody steal it. Don't let anybody rob you of it. You are not responsible for what other people think about your dream, how they respond to your dream, how they feel about your dream. If they mock your dream, squash the mockers. His own dad mocked him. It might be the people closest to you that mock you. Oh, pfft. 
You're going to buy a car? Nobody in our family's bought a car. Well, I'll be the first then. Watch me. You know, them cars have got a lot of insurance and stuff. You going to pay for all that insurance? Yes. Yeah, I will. You're going to start a business? Man, it's real. It's a bad time for starting a business, you know. The biz, biz, I mean, it's, I, don't know how you, I don't know why I'm a country guy right now. So if you're country, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to. I just needed a different voice. But sometimes it's the people that are closest to you. They have every reason. Just because someone else started a business and failed doesn't mean yours will. If, if you follow the plan of God and process the plan of God through prayer, God will not let you fail. If you're not meant to start the business, guess what? Through prayer, you'll figure it out. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I thought I was supposed to start a business, but the more I pray, the more I think it's not the right time. Okay, then it's not the right time. It doesn't mean the dream is gone. It means it's not the right time. Follow it. Be led by the Spirit. You're only going to be led by the Spirit if you spend time with the Spirit. That was really good. I don't have a dog anymore. It didn't work out for our family. But when I had a dog, you know, I couldn't lead him anywhere if he didn't come with me. If he wasn't on the leash and I was taking him, he had to be with me. He had to be close. I had to teach him and train him. You will not be led by the Spirit if you're not spending time with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Number two, let me read James 5.16 just real quick. The, in the Amplified, I mentioned it earlier, but the second half of this, look down here, because the first half, the Amplified makes everything really long. But look right here, the earnest, everybody say heartfelt. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power, of a tremendous power. What kind of power? Power to get you through the situation. Power to get, get over, over the hill. Power to get over the hump. Power to abolish, uh, uh, just just. Maybe a better word would be demolish the obstacle. Demolish power. Say it again. Say power. power. Say this. Say my prayer, my prayer produces, power. produces power. I'm not going to be a weak prayer. I'm a powerful prayer. You recognize that you need help. Recognize that you won't get it any other way. Luke 6.45 says, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. The King James says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this is how you know, this is not meant to be condemning, but this is meant to be a check. Ready? That's how you know if you're praying anti-faith, because if you pray and then afterwards you start speaking opposite of what you're believing for, out of your heart you speak. That means you need to fix the inside. That means more time. How does faith come? Romans 8 tells us faith comes by hearing the word of God. So as I get God's word inside of me, it changes my heart, changes my spirit. My spirit man is built up. And then as I do, boom, I'm going to pray that out, believe that out. I'm going to speak it out. Feed your spirit. Change your heart with the word. Number two, we must pray according to the word. You must pray according to the word. Every time you are believing God for something, you should attach it with scripture. God, God, his word is the foundation of our Christian belief. So if he said it in his word, like, like for instance, Philippians 4.19 says, I will supply all your need according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's the possessive way of wording it. That's what he said. Okay, so if that's what he said, then I can attach that to a need-based prayer and stand on that. Amen? Isaiah 62.6, listen to this. You who are servants, who are his servants, and by your prayers, put the Lord in remembrance of his promises. And don't keep silent. You have to pray and put in remembrance. Now, God's not an idiot. He knows his word. Okay, so what are you doing? You're reminding yourself and reminding the devil, this is what I'm standing on. Right here, this is what I live by. Right here, this is what I have founded my family on. This right here is what moves me. You won't move me. This. That's what you're doing. Look at the next one, Isaiah 55, right? 55, 11. So shall my word be, look at this, that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return void to me, 
Meaning that it will not produce, it won't come back without producing any effect. It won't come back useless. It shall accomplish that which I please and purpose. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. When you pray out God's word, you're praying that. Your word prospers. And your word says this. Your word, you know, faith comes by hearing. Every time you confess God's word, it just builds your faith more. Like, well, I just every, I, you know, I get in this mood and then people say stuff and I just kind of get out of faith. Speak God's word. Shut that stuff off and speak God's word. I just, I start feeling depressed again. I start feeling, I know, I, I've been there. You know how you fix it? You either listen to preaching that has God's word in it that will build your faith up or speak God's word or both. Because God's word is what's going to build your faith. Third thing you can do, which we'll talk about in a second, is praise God. Because praise reminds you of what God has done, what he is doing, and what he's about to do. And it changes your focus from the problem to the solution. Never, listen to this, very important. Never lower the way you talk or pray to the level of how things are going right now. Never ever lower the way you are talking, the way you are praying to the way things are going right now. You do not lower your mouth, the words that are coming out of your mouth, to the situation around you. You bring the situation around you up to the word. And the only thing that can do that is the word. The only thing they do is say, see, I know what that doctor's report says. That's information. But the revelation I have of God's word says, by his stripes I'm healed. So if I, this is what it looks like, real practically, ready? I like to get practical every once in a while, I gotta hurry. But listen, you get the doctor's report, it's negative. Praying the problem looks like this. Heavenly Father, I, I got this report, and it's, uh, I don't wanna die. I don't, wanna, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna lose everything. I don't wanna lose all that. You're praying problems. You're praying stuff that hasn't even happened yet. You're praying out, I, I know you have those feelings, I've been there. I'm not condemning anyone, I'm saying that's not, find that in the Bible where God instructs us to pray that way. No, he says, bring your cares to him and leave it to him. Leave it with him. Cast your cares on the Lord. So what is praying the solution? Heavenly Father, that report is of the devil. It says I have cancer, but I believe your word that I'm healed. I don't know how it came in, but I thank you, Heavenly Father, for removing it from my body. I thank you that every day my body falls in line with your word. I thank you that every day I am healed. Every day I'm going to walk in the healing you provided for me. I thank you, Lord, that the way you supernaturally healed people through your son Jesus when he walked on this earth, the same way I'll be healed today. I'm not going to get sicker as I get older. I'm going to get healthier as I get older. Well, what scripture is that? The Bible says in old age you'll be vital. It's in Psalms. Read it. You'll be vital, like a tree planted by water that grows and sprouts. That's going to be me. I don't listen to those, uh, uh, are you, are you uh, having problems using the bathroom? <laughs> like, I'm in, I'm in my 30s, so I'm not quite there yet. But I've seen the, are you over the age of 50 and have problems? Um, no, I'm not over the age of 50, and I'm not going to have problems going to the bathroom. <laughs> Who's keeping track of how many times you go pee-pee anyways? You know, one of those commercials, no joke, it says that if you take the medicine, it'll help you go, go to the bathroom less, right? But then one, some of the side effects are complete loss of hearing and complete loss of vision. <laughs> I'll just go pee-pee ten times a day and be able to see. <laughs> if you're praying or speaking in unbelief, you're deficient of God's word. You're deficient of God's word. There's a deficiency. The same way you'd have, if you went to the doctor and they drew your blood and they said, well, you're deficient in vitamin D or you're deficient in this. You're deficient. Of, if you're speaking contrary, and you'll begin to catch it. As you get around a faith message like this, you'll begin to catch it. You'll be like, you know, I didn't realize I say that so much. My kids, like, you know, sometimes you say, like, no, baby, I, like I'll talk to my kids. No, baby, I can't do that right now. And they'll correct me. Daddy, we don't say can't. Because we put it in them. God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I'm not, I'm not putting in them doubt and unbelief at, at, at age three. So they'll correct me. You're, you're right, baby, you're right. Um, Daddy is unable to complete that task for you at this moment. <laughs> i got to hurry. Ready? Number three. Some of these we've already covered, so it's just more of a reminder. Like these next couple. Number three, pray with faith in Jesus' name. 
Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Look at that. If you believe you've received it, how do you pray in faith? You believe at the time you asked it, it's done. I gave you instruction a couple weeks ago. There's a great message out there from the 14th um, that you can look, again, our YouTube website, stuff like that. But listen, it says this, uh, uh, that when you, when you pray, when you pray, you ask God once. Once you've asked God once, thank him for it after that. Thank him for it after that. Number four, come through the name of Jesus. Come through the name of Jesus. We talked a couple weeks ago about how Jesus is like the stamp that sends your mail. If you put a letter in the mail, it's not going to get sent unless it's got a stamp. Jesus said this in John 16. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth. Listen to Jesus' words. Listen to how powerful it is when you use Jesus' name. Listen to how potent it is when you end your prayers or even throughout your prayers, you stamp it with the name of Jesus. I tell you the truth. You ask the Father directly, and he will grant your, he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before, but ask using my name, and you will receive. And you will have abundant joy. Not only will God give me what I'm asking for, as long as it lines up with the word. You have to look at the Bible holistically. I know Jesus didn't say it here, but he said it in other places. You ask according to the word. If you ask according to the word, my Father hears you. So you put it all together. So this applies. In Jesus' name, I ask according to the word. That was number two. What happened? He hears me, and it's done. That's why you can confidently thank God after that. Well, how long do you thank him? Until you get the direction, until it comes to fruition. Well, well, what, well what if I don't see it? Yeah, I know. You won't, I, that, that's the point of processing the plan. Listen, if we had faith, if we had faith to the point that you could just say something, would it really be faith if you could just... If God gave you everything without you having to ask for it, would you need him? That's what he wants. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to walk it out with through him. Amen? Number five, exercise your power over demonic and evil powers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gloss over this one because if I get deep into this, we won't finish. Amen. I'll be preaching at 3 o'clock. Luke 10, 18 and 19. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all. Everybody say this. Say over all the power. Over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You need to exercise your power. Sometimes when you're praying, you have, there, are, there are demonic forces that are up against you. You deal with them on earth. God gave you power and authority to do that. You say, in the name of Jesus, I bind anything demonic that's, that's caused this thing, and it's got to go in Jesus' name. I'll teach more on that later. Number six, pray with thanksgiving. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Number seven, pray in the Spirit. I've talked a lot about praying in tongues the last couple of weeks. We've had demonstrations of it. We've had, it's been wonderful, wonderful to see God move and demonstrate what he, what he teaches us in his word. I want to give you some further instruction on praying. In 1 Corinthians 14, what does Paul say? What is the conclusion then? I will pray in the spirit and I will pray in my understanding. I will sing in the spirit and I will sing in my understanding. Right? 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For one speaks in an unknown tongue. Speaks not to men, but to God. When you're praying in tongues, this is why I taught on a Wednesday night. Why you should ask God and believe God for the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Why? Because it's a heavenly prayer language that Paul instructed us here. Look, you speak not to men, but to God. No one understands him or catches his meaning because in the Holy Spirit he utters secret truths. Wow, that sounds like the hidden mysterious things we talked about earlier. He utters secret truths and hidden things not obvious to the understanding. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, 9. This is what scriptures mean when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We quote that a lot. We'll get people real excited. Oh, no eye has seen what God's going to do for you. And everybody's like, woo. But look what it says right here in verse 10. But it was to us that God revealed these things. How? By his spirit. Again, I tell you. You will not be led by the Spirit unless you're spending time with the Spirit. Now, you can pray in spirit, you can pray in the Spirit, meaning that you're in the presence of God in English. 
Praying in tongues is not the only way to do that, but praying in tongues is a guaranteed way to do it because Paul instructs us, when I'm praying in tongues, my spirit is praying, my understanding is not, I'm not, it says my understanding is unfruitful. Just like a tree, a tree produces fruit if it's working, right? If it's not working, it doesn't produce this fruit. Does it? So I, I, I turn my mind off, my spirit is doing the praying. Romans 8 instructs us further. It says that he makes intercession for us. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. What is interceding? It means that the Holy Spirit's standing in the gap and saying, I know what's going on in his life. I'm going to intercede and pray for him. How many times have you prayed in English for about five minutes and you're like, I don't have the breakthrough. I don't know what to do. I still have the problem. I've asked God, but I need help. That's when you pray in the Spirit. And that's when praying in tongues carries you further than you can in English. It carries you further. It takes you further. I'm going to teach more on that on Wednesday night. Number eight. Everybody stand up as I close. Number eight. Pray with expectation. Pray with expectation. Jeremiah 33, 3, that we read earlier, says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things, which you do not know. James 5, 16, The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic, and it's working. When I was praying the other day, the Lord gave me this phrase, and I want to give it back to you. Ready? And I know it's a cheesy phrase, but have you ever heard the word push? P-U-S-H, pray until something happens? I know it's like one of those real, it's like WWJD, I know. But it's good. Pray until something happens. But this is what the Lord put in my heart, because I'm real visual. So the first time I say push, it was just the word push, like lowercase. But then the second time, it was P, like the acronym P-U-S-H. When I push in the flesh, I get flesh results. But when I push, P-U-S-H, in the spirit, I get Holy Ghost results. When you, when you force things in the flesh without processing the plan of God, you leave your future in limbo. And God does not want your future. If you've gotten anything out of today, hear me, God does not want your future in limbo. He wants you to know that he has a future for you and it's bright and it's awesome and he's got great plans for you and he wants to take you somewhere. He wants to take you higher. And if you'll listen to him and you'll obey him and you'll pray out the plan, he'll give you the details. He'll give you the secret things. He'll bring the walls down and show you here's how you're going to get through that. Here's how you're going to get past that. I'm going to help you and I'm going to put this person there and then I'm going to put that person there and then I'm going to have you work there for a little bit. And then that he can do the impossible. He can do things that we can no otherwise, not otherwise do, and he'll give you the information. Process the plan through prayer. I'm going to give you a minute right now with every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you just to pray. and ask, like, Lord, anything they need, I believe today through the instruction of your word, you've given them what the thing they're missing. That's my prayer today. The thing they're missing that's been hindering their prayers from being answered, that they receive it today. If they haven't received it yet, they're right now, you speak to them. It's that. That's what you're missing. It's this. That's what you're missing. Just keep doing this. Now, with your eyes still closed and your head still bowed, if you're in this room and you want your prayers answered, the Bible tells us the first prayer that God hears is the prayer of salvation. The prayer that says, I'm a sinner, but I don't want to sin anymore. I want to be forgiven and cleansed. And the Bible tells us that God will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That he'll forgive you of your sins. That he loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. Knowing, the Bible tells us he knew exactly everything that was wrong with us. But he still did it. He knew every sin, every problem, how corrupt and how evil. No, I, st I love him too much. I'm going to send my son to die in their place. In Jesus' name, I ask you today, every single person in here, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, do not leave here without knowing I'm saved and I'm going. If anything were to happen to me, I'm going to heaven. The first prayer God hears is the prayer of salvation. The prayer that says, I repent of my sins and I ask you to come in my heart. He's not asking you to be perfect today. He's asking you to accept him, to be open to him, and then he'll work on the perfecting part. He'll work on the inside part. He'll work on the, hey, we're going to work on this.
we're going to help you with that. But you can't have the latter without the former. You have to have Jesus. You have to have Jesus. You have to have Jesus. You have to accept Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, ready? If that's you today, you say, I've never accepted Jesus. I, I, I mean, I've known about him. I've been to church, but I've never accepted Jesus. Maybe you've never been to church. It's the first time you've ever come. And you're like, I, I, I want that. I want what you're talking about. I want that security. I want to know that if something were to happen to me and I were to die today, I'm spending eternity in heaven with my heavenly Father, with Jesus Christ on the throne. That's where I'm going. But you're only going to know that unless you do what the Bible says, which is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Or maybe you're a second person that says, I, I did that a long time ago, but I've been off the rails. And I need to get back on the path. I need to get back on right now. I need to recommit my life. I need to rededicate my life. If you're either one of those two types of people and the Holy Spirit's dealing with you and tugging on your heart and saying, yeah, don't leave here today without that. I want you to make a decision right now. That's me. That's me. I'm going to make that decision today. It may be the, the 30th time or the 100th time, and God does not care. He wants you. He wants that commitment. Or maybe the first time, and I promise you, everybody in here is going to rejoice, and every angelic being in heaven is going to rejoice at your decision to serve God. So if that's you, either one of those two types of people, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand and let me know. I'm going to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want to pray with you. On your count of three, one, two, three. Raise your hand and let me know. That's me. Come on. Anybody in here? Don't leave here without knowing. Don't leave here without knowing. Amen. Anybody? Listen, if you're online, let, write us in the comments and let us know. Just in case there's someone online, everybody open your eyes and look at me. I guess everyone in, the here, in here, we've had several salvations over the last couple weeks. So I trust that everybody in here is good, and that's great. But just in case there's anyone online, pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, today I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a sin-free life, but died on the cross for me. I also believe on the third day he rose from the grave. I believe he's seated in heaven right now with you, my heavenly Father. So I open my heart. I ask you to come in, make your home in me. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I leave my past behind. And today, I make you my Lord and Savior. I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm delivered, and I'm going to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you. I'm going to dismiss. If you're a big, strong man, I need you down front afterwards. I need you to talk to all the big, strong men for about five minutes. Actually, listen to that, like 90 seconds. If you're a weak man, please, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for keeping me out of trouble today. I love you. Lord, bless everybody as they leave here. Watch over them and protect them and keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you greatly. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us today at Family Worship Center. I know that you were blessed and encouraged by today's service, and we just want to say thank you for joining us. Listen, if this was your first time here, first time as a part of our family, we encourage you type new in the comments before you log off and let us know that you're new, or maybe send us a direct message. Connect with us somehow because we want to say welcome to the family by sending you a free gift. Also, I want to encourage you to, to all of our family who watch online, stay connected with us. Stay connected to our upcoming events on our website. Stay connected to our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Of course, our YouTube channel where we're releasing videos weekly. We want to keep you connected to what God's doing at Family Worship Center. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe all of our content so that you never miss something new from FWC. Well, we love you, God bless you, and we'll see you next time.